What's up, everyone? This is Jeff Watson, and I'm joined by my partner, as always, Joe. And we are back for another edition of the Insiders Interview Series. And honestly, tonight I am I'm I'm trying my best to keep my composure because I'm kind of being a fanboy and I need to stop. But we have uh, the one and only Monique Dupree. Not only is she an actress, a singer but a professional wrestler as well, a former professional wrestler. And she still does some things in the business. So, Monique, how are you this evening? I'm great. How are you guys today? We are, we're doing well, uh, doing well, trying to stay safe and all this stuff. And hopefully you are as well. Absolutely. I had to take a COVID test before, of course, before I flew out here. Well, I take a COVID test twice a week because I've been doing a lot of, um, a lot more acting work recently because COVID slowed down, of course, House of Hardcore, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into, but um, we haven't been doing shows. So I've gone back into my acting in the interim because I miss being in front of the camera. Um, so I make sure I take a COVID test twice a week. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's, let's start with, uh, since this is a professional wrestling podcast we'll start with professional wrestling how did you when did you get involved in wrestling and um how did that happen for you well first i have to say that i've been a fan of wrestling most of my life like since i'm nine or ten um i forget because it was like toward the end of the year so i don't actually remember whether i was nine or whether i had just turned ten but either way um i've been submersed in professional wrestling all of my life really. Um, so that's decades and I'm not telling my age, but, but I kind of am. Um, I would start going to shows because as a, as a kid, I, I've never really been able to tell this story. So I feel like this is the perfect place to do it because it's a wrestling podcast. So as a fan of professional wrestling growing up, we grew up extremely poor and I grew up with my grandmother and my great grandmother and I was never able to afford to go to shows. You know how people always have the story, but well, I was a kid and I got to go see this live and blah, 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 blah. I never had those experiences. Everything was on television for me. And the first time I ever got to go to a professional wrestling show um, was when I got to take my daughter who is the other half of the double duprees and she was a teenager at the time so needless to say i was an adult by the time i got to um go we went to wrestlemania like i just skipped all of the little stuff and just went to the big thing <laughs> and yeah. um then i started to like i really fell in love i said oh my god live shows are the best and then i started going to tna house shows when it was tna before it became impact wrestling mm -hmm. and um befriended Don West, who is just the best um, hype man and whatnot in professional wrestling, in my humble opinion, uh, or at least was. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with going to the shows. So we were at WrestleMania in Georgia in 2011 when I met Tommy Dreamer. So enter Tommy Dreamer into my life. Mm -hmm. And that is when my life as I know it pretty much started to change where I became, I went from a wrestling fan to two years later, I'm involved in professional wrestling. I mean, so much happened in that two years time, he would take me to shows and show me the ins and outs of things before he had his own uh, promotion, which was House of Hardcore. House of Hardcore was born in 2012. That was the first show. I was pregnant at the time and he was like, I really would like for you to attend this show and tell me what you think of it. So the first show I was pregnant, but by the second show, I worked the show where I got in the ring for the first time ever with Sandman, with Blue Meanie and with Guido. How lucky was I to be in the ring with all of these ECW greats for my first time ever. Right. 
Um, I will never forget that moment because not too many people can say that, you know, he trusted me to be able to do my thing for the first time ever in a ring with these greats, with these legends, um, with these living legends. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of how I got involved. And from 2013, I started, I was valeting. And then I went from valeting to, he saw that I had skills behind the scenes. Like he saw that I had producer skills and like things of that nature. And he was like, hey, this woman has brains too. And so he just started trying my hand at little things in House of Hardcore. And the next thing I know, I'm side by side with him, helping him to run this company, like to keep it going behind the scenes. I'm doing tickets. I'm uh, at the door, taking tickets at the door. I'm doing stuff behind the scenes, producing, making sure the show runs. I'm going in front. I'm going in the ring. I'm doing everything. I was what they were calling me a mini Tommy dreamer. <laughs> Because like my responsibilities were endless. There was no one thing that I would say that I would do when they say, what do you do in House of Hardcore? I was like, I do everything and anything that I needed to do, period. Um, and then we got involved with Twitch and then I started doing stuff with Twitch with House of Hardcore. And it, it's, just, it's just been a, a hell of a ride since. And then COVID happened, so it kind of um, curb those things uh, in the interim. Right. Wow. So, I mean, in that moment, I mean, going back to that first match that you were involved with, what did you realize in that moment how big of a deal that was? I, I think I didn't realize until my wig came off. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> So I had shaved my hair um, uh, to donate it uh, to Locks of Love. So I was bald. So he said, I know a perfect spot for you where you're wearing your hair and Sandman dips you and then goes to grab your hair and it just comes off. So I was like, okay. But I was thinking at the time, I'm like, that sounds kind of hokey, but you know, you're the boss. And this was my first time ever going out. So I'm like, who am I to question this man, right? Mm -hmm. So I go out, I do that spot. It was like the biggest pop I had heard live. It was huge. And in that moment, I realized I was, I was a part of a moment. I was a part of a pivotal House of Hardcore a moment that people will go, you remember that girl whose wig uh, Sandman pulled off and then he caned it and then he did the Ric Flair on it? Like, I still have that wig. I, I never wore it again, but I saved it. <laughs> because it was part of House of Hardcore history. And um, that I think that was the moment when I realized, holy crap, I'm... I'm a part of a great House of Hardcore moment. And that was just the second show. I always knew that uh, House of Hardcore would be something special because look at the brainchild behind it. Tommy Dreamer is like one of the most, uh, one of the greatest you know, guys in professional wrestling. He's one of the greatest minds in professional wrestling. He, you know, he can do everything. He's so passionate about what it is that he, does he's hired so many talented people and that's why i felt honored if he looked at me and saw something in me and said hey i'm putting this girl out here to do this 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 and this that means that he saw something in me and i take that seriously i'm sorry because there's a there's a there's a kid in here so i gotta <laughs> it's I not my kid <laughs> i love kids i've got three so i i completely understand well, you guys know I have ten, so I, you know. Yeah, you. I so we, you know, <laughs> wow. we got about that then. So, um, God how, bless. <laughs> God bless. So, so yeah, I mean, you're you're a mother of ten, and you're an actress. You do everything that you're doing. Um, 
how do you keep up? Oh my God, where do you find the time? Good well, Lord. All red wine. That's kind of uh, how <laughs> my life is. <laughs> if I did not have red wine, I would probably be in a padded room right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally, it's water and wine for me and my life. Um, it's it's hard, but it's not hard because I've been a I I feel like I've been a multitasker all of my life. Mm -hmm. So it made it a little bit easier for me to like juggle this life. And I think when somebody told me before, when I got pregnant, you'll never be able to be an actress and be a mom at the same time. And I said, oh, for real? All right, hold my glass of wine, watch me. And that's exactly what I did. And over a hundred films later, and God knows what else I've done that I, I can't remember right now. Uh, I'm still doing what I love. This is my nine to five. My nine to five is producing. My nine to five is doing the House of Hardcore podcast. It's acting. It's everything in the entertainment industry that I want to do, I'm doing still to this day at the the tender age of 45, <laughs> I'll be 46 in a couple of weeks. So okay. it's been a hell of a ride so far and I have no intentions on stopping at all. So let, let's talk about your, um, talk a little bit about your film career um, and then I will kick it over to Joe because I know he has some questions because I'll, I mean, I'll go ahead and be honest with you. Both of us, we're like huge horror movie fans. Oh my goodness, yes. yes. Oh, oh my goodness. I'm so <laughs> glad that you are. Oh <laughs> my goodness, <laughs> yes. Um, we often cross it over with wrestling yeah. in our show because I am, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm showing my age here too, so I completely feel you. I'm, I'm going, uh, I've got about five years on you. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I'm going back to like the 80s when I used to watch wrestling growing up, um, and I, I'm a gimmick guy. I absolutely love. I mean, give me a good gimmick with a wrestler, and I'm all over it. And mixing nowadays, like with, I mean, we're coming up on celebrating the 30th anniversary of Undertaker, like guys like him. Uh uh, oh, and like uh, so many of those like characters that I'm seeing and now and that I mean today we're talking about Bray Wyatt with the fiend and like characters like that I absolutely love. Yeah. Um yeah. so the fact that you crossed over in both of those things, I absolutely think that's fantastic. And yeah, I can't wait to talk about it. Yes, yeah. I love I mean, I grew up on horror, obviously. Um my you know, my brother is is in in horror, obviously. But um, I grew up loving horror. And I'll tell you something. Horror fans and wrestling fans are part of the same community. Yes. So when I made the transition from horror to wrestling, it wasn't a, a far stretch um, in terms of fan base. And just like horror fans, wrestling fans are some of the most loyal fans out there, bar none, period. That's it. That's all. It's it's all about the wrestling fans. They're they're die hard, and I love it because I'm one of those people. That's, you you answered my question perfectly. I mean, <laughs> did you did you get into horror because of your brother, or was no, it okay? I did not. Um, I thought I was going to be a comedian, <laughs> which is wow. which is is very, very strange. I I love comedy as well. Um, what I've always identified with, with comedians that I never really understood was they utilize their sadness and what they go through in their life and they kind of turn it around and make jokes of it and make light of it to make you laugh. But there's there's something there, like there's there's that sadness, but there's also that brilliance. And being right. able to take your hardships and turning it turning it around to make us laugh, I've always loved that about comedy. And um, I I thought that I was gonna get into comedy, and then I kind of found my love of horror and was like, nope, nope, this is what I'm gonna do right here. 
even though my first film was Lean On Me, which is not a horror film at all, but my brother was in it and I had a, a cameo part in it, but that was where my love of film started was in Lean On Me when I was just a kid. Wow. So it, uh, but for me, there's nothing like horror. I was just talking about this on a, um, uh, a women in horror film panel. I love being made to be the bad guy. I do not like doing the no. cute, pretty woman. Give me some some nasty makeup. I'm typecast as the bad guy. I don't know what it is about me in professional wrestling and horror alike. I'm never anybody good. I'm never anybody sweet or nice. I'm always the evil person. I'm always the bad guy. And I'm like, okay, that's okay. I could do that. This is my life. I'm like the female Danny Trejo in horror. Okay. Oh, <laughs> you know? nice. Um, so but you know what? I'm okay with being typecast. A lot of people have an issue with that. I love being the badass. I'm okay, so okay with that. I love the makeup effects. Um, the one film that I did, Bachelor Party in a Bungalow of the Dam, such a long title. Um, I was in makeup for, it took 10 hours for them to do my makeup. Wow. And, but I sat there for 10 hours. I couldn't eat the whole day. They had to put a straw up the whole of my nose and down into my mouth for me to eat. Holy cow. I couldn't, like I had no mouth, so I couldn't eat anything. And I had to do that the, the whole day. And I had not one complaint. I didn't complain not one time because I felt like getting in that makeup helped me to become the character that that I was. And I just, it, it just kind of unleashed me. Plus I was angry because I was hungry. So it was easy <laughs> it was, it was to play that wow. character. Cause I was just like, you know, everybody else is eating chicken and you're like sticking a straw up my nose so I can drink, you know, my meal. So of course I'm angry. So it helped me to play my character uh, a lot better as well. Awesome. Joe, I know you have some questions. I do. I do. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love the connection between the two, and I love how you said about the fan bases being similar, and I totally agree with you. Um, I think there's such a, you know, there's such a, a, a connection there, I think, between both worlds. Um, so, when... I mean, what I mean, you had said you enjoy playing a badass, which is fantastic. I mean, when you're going to horror films, how many times are you rooting for the bad guy in those films anyway? I mean, yeah. I'm a big Friday the 13th fan, and, and you go to the movie to root for Jason. You don't yeah. watch and root for the kids that he's going after. Um, yeah. So <laughs> what, I mean, what films, what are the favorite films that you've done? If you can pick any, I mean, you've done so many. So if you can pick just a couple, what were the favorite films you did and what parts did you really, really like playing the most? Wow. That's, I know that's, it's a long list to pick from. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to sit here and I'm trying to, of uh, all the films that I've done, like, well, ah, uh, well, I, I did, I already said Bachelor Party in the Bungalow of the Dam. Um, because I actually played a, I was a vampire posing as a stripper in that film. So I really enjoyed that. Um, I did a film recently and although it's not, it's not a horror, I have to say that I really enjoyed, uh, playing my character is called the Mick and the Trick. I just wrapped that film a couple of weeks ago in, uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, um, I, I got to play a badass and I got to use my wrestling skills and cross it over into acting because I got to put my own, my fight scene together um, with my ex-husband. And that was really, really awesome to be able to do that we choreographed our own fight scene and did it. And I did like the Superman punch. Oh, it was awesome. Like That's awesome. I got to play a badass. So I was just like, even though it, it's a it's a comedy, um, it was still something really, really cool. And I got to work alongside Peter Green, whom I loved in The Mask. Like, you know, yeah. he's, he's a character in and of himself. But um, Tom DiNucci is the director of that film. And I was so fortunate 
to be able to be on that set. And Tommy Dreamer is actually the person that recommended me for that film. Um, I think the other film that I enjoyed, not to like try to toot my own horn, but I have to because I'm proud of my accomplishments. I did a film, a short called uh, Shadowhunters Devil Speak. Um, and Tommy starred in that. And I directed it and I did a small acting bit in it. I'm very, very proud of that film. I'm very, very proud of playing the bad guy or one of the bad guys. Sorry. They, they, oh, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, they're making me miss my kids, though. Like, I'm totally looking at them like, oh, I can't wait to get home. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, I got to play a bad guy. I got to direct. I got to produce. Um, I got to direct Tommy, which was amazing. Uh, so that's one of my favorites. And that's also, that's available on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it for free. Um, I have quite a few films on Amazon Prime. If you just Google my name, you can, uh, you can watch it for free. That's awesome. I can't, I can't, I can't remember, I honestly, because I've, I've literally done over 100 films. I'm sitting here trying to remember some of them. <laughs> I, was, I was sitting here like, oh, why am I drawing a blank? I will say that during COVID, I've been really, really blessed that I've been able to, I filmed four movies from my own green screen because in New York, uh, my apartment, I have nothing but a green screen and equipment and everything. And that's where I do all of my filming. So I had to film my own scenes for a, a few movies and I got to direct it and do my wardrobe and do everything and, and send my vision to the director for them to say whether they liked it or not. And they ended up, you know, liking what I did. So I'm, I'm very proud of those things. I'm proud of the things that I have a hand in being able to direct or do styling for because I love fashion, in case you haven't noticed from all of my crazy photos. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I love, you know, men and women's fashion alike. I had just posted something to say when Tommy Dreamer was on the MLB network before, uh, I think it was the first time he was ever on, I actually pulled out his outfit for him for that for that appearance that he did so like i got my little styling credit or what have you it's another thing that i love fashion that's awesome that's awesome man you keep yourself busy that's insane you've got so much going on that's awesome i, I try to but let me tell you something working with working with dreamer will keep you busy because I, sure he always has an endless amount of things that <laughs> that is needed. So <laughs> you were talking about Reading PA. That's kind of my neck of the woods. I live up in Northeast PA actually. And I, I can remember seeing your husband in an ECW show in a little town called Jim Thorpe, or I'm sorry, seeing uh, Tommy in, in Jim Thorpe years and years back. Um, it, it's crazy how the time goes by. And, and uh, you know, you mentioned all those guys you're in the ring with uh, yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. So I, I have to ask you too, obviously about wrestling. I I mean, what do you think of the status of women's wrestling today? I mean, I think, you know, we see some good things happening in certain places. And I, I Jeff and I are huge fans of Impact because I just love what they do. I think their storylines are really good there. I think they've got some great athletes there. I love their women's division there as well. But, I mean, what do you think of, of you know, how it's come along from obviously what it used to be and, and what it is today? And do you think there's any improvements that you personally would like to see, you know, kind of going forward? Ooh. I always have a hard time talking about what I feel personally in terms of stuff like that. But I will say we've definitely come a long way from um, – well, see, I, I kind of want to say it, but I don't want to say it we've come a long way from just being like women in bikinis or, you know, just being the eye candy. But then if you think about ECW, those women were always hardcore. Yep. Um, so they not only looked good, but they tore it up as well, always. So, but ECW to me was ahead of its time. You know what I'm saying? So, um, 
then you know then we had you know women's wrestling which is okay i'm not gonna lie to you i mostly only watch impact now yep. oh yeah and i love the strong women that the the knockouts division i love those women i love how hard they go i love how they're athletes and how you recognize them as such you know and i feel like we've 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 kind of come a long way with that i mean there's been splashes of that going throughout uh throughout wrestling but i think it's it's stronger than ever right now with um women's empowerment and such that you know you not only you have women of all shapes and sizes and all beauties like everybody's being accepted and i love that i love that empowerment and I just want to, I would want to see it continue to evolve. I don't want to see it stop right here where it is now. I want to see it get better and better and better. One of the things that I feel like I love about Impact is that they expand upon that and they're not afraid to continue to expand upon it. And I'm not saying that just because like I'm here and <laughs> I'm here <laughs> or anything like that. Like I honestly, um, I honestly am like, wow, I'm blown away. And I find myself, you know, glued to the TV on, on Tuesdays, just going, well, you know, I'm watching on Twitch um, and going, wow, this is amazing. I mean, some of these people are my friends, but like just watching them as athletes getting in the ring, actually being able to show their talents as a wrestler makes me feel really, really good as a woman. Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've, um, Jeff watched it longer than I have. I just kind of got into it around slam anniversary again, and I had watched it prior years ago, but, um, I I've got to say, I mean, honestly, it is my favorite show to watch. Uh, Jeff and I do a watch along stream on Tuesdays with a, with a community of ours that, um, you know, a lot of them have just recently got into it as well. And, and every one of them now comes in, they really love the show. And, and, uh, I'm absolutely impressed. I think everybody does a great job. I love the promos there that they do i love the storylines i love yeah i'm i'm really impressed by it and uh and i'm hooked <laughs> yeah i'm a i'm a i'm a super duper fan and i'll tell you something else like you look at somebody like katie forbes and people will go well you know she's just a body or whatever but she can wrestle yep. like you know she's like she's like happy party girl but when it's time to get down she like yes yes i could fight too i could wrestle too you know it's not just it's not just her boyfriend um it's it's amazing to see and i miss the pre covid days because i used to be behind the scenes where i'm just like watching them uh as they're developing as they're putting stuff together you know because i'm with Tommy so i just come and i just sit around and watch uh, what's what's happening and I'm just like wow these women are just so strong they're they're so great and then to watch them come alive you know and wrestle and I sit back and think of how when I was growing up I wanted to be Miss Elizabeth yep she yep. wasn't I mean she she was definitely a mastermind in a different way, but she wasn't the wrestler, right. you know what I'm saying? So I wanted to be her for a while and then I evolved and then I wanted to be Sensational Sherry because I was like, she's wild, she's crazy. Like she was my Grace Jones of wrestling. Yeah, oh, that's awesome, I'm man. very much a fan of Grace Jones. So if I had to make the correlation, I would say she was my Grace Jones of wrestling. So I was like, yeah, I'm about to be Sherry Martell. Like I'm about to be a wrestler and I'm going to manage and I'm going to be crazy and I'm going to fight men and I'm going to do all of this stuff. Like it, it, it evolved. And, but you see wrestling today and you see the women today and you see that they're their own individuals. And I love that. You know, it's not like, I love a, a wrestler because she's connected to this guy. It's because she's her own person. And it's because she can kick your ass all by herself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody else. It's they're, they're being seen for the athletes that they are instead of just being seen as um, objectified would be the, the perfect uh, terminology. But again, like I said, ECW was ahead of its time because those women have always been 
hardcore. Yep. Yeah. Period. Yeah. No, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, that's a great point. And I mean, I can remember watching ECW back in the day and it was, I mean, I, I talked to Jeff about this all the time. It was on, on the East coast. It would come on so late on a Saturday night. It'd be on at like 12, 1230 in the morning. And I'm, I mean, I'm a night owl, so I stay up till all hours anyway, but I can remember watching that. And you know, it wasn't just anyone who watched it, the fans that watched it. Oh my goodness. The fan base for that show was just absolutely amazing. Um, and you were, you're right. It was absolutely ahead of its time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, no one saw that coming. And no. then people would go out and you'd go to shows and stuff like that. Oh my goodness. It was, it was, it was awesome to watch. Yeah, it, it absolutely was. I, I miss it. I've got glimmers of ECW with House of Hardcore. And for me to have been able to be a part of it, and I don't say it in past tense, I'm just saying it because we're on hiatus right now um, due to COVID. Yep. So, we probably won't be doing any shows again until 2021 if COVID acts right and <laughs> is act together uh, yeah. and goes the hell away. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to see um, ourselves clear of doing some House of Hardcore shows. And while I've done some impact shows, I mean, I've done, I've done tons of independent shows where I've valeted or managed or whatever the case might be. Um, uh, even uh, Hornswoggle's promotion, uh, ACW, I got a chance to do last year, I think it was, um, in Wisconsin, because our last House of Hardcore show in Wisconsin, I got a chance to work that show because Tommy was working the show. And I've, I've worked plenty of independent shows, but I loved the time that I got to work Bound for Glory, where I came out with Moose. Um, that was an awesome, that was another awesome moment for me that I did not foresee because I wasn't supposed to come out with him. Um, but it, it was just very, very last minute where it happened. And that's what I'm saying. I love that um, Tommy knows that I'm that pliable where he can go, hey, Monique, I need you to do this. And I'm like, all right, uh, when? What do you need me to dress like? What do you need me to do? What? And I always make sure I bring uh, stuff with me because I never know what I'm doing. Uh, that's the great thing about working with Tommy. And I have so much to be able to put on my resume because he just entrusts so much in me. I remember the hardcore show that we were doing and I was running around like crazy. They call me the crazy lady because it looked like my hair is always on top of my head. And I'm like this, like people come, are coming up to me and say, hi, I'm like, and I'm just running around, right? And so something happened. I forgot what it was. And I came up to Tommy and I was like, um, this, that, or the other happened. Um, what are you going to do? He was like, I'm not doing anything. You you handle it. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I'm going over here. You go handle that. I realized in retrospect that he didn't do that because like, you know, he didn't care or something like that. He knew that I could handle it, even though I didn't know I could handle it. So I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> this is your issue. This isn't my issue. But I went and I handled the situation. And, and that's that's what I do. And I didn't realize how much I had done in that company until I really sat back and thought about it. We've done 50 some odd shows. I think like 56, 57 um, House of Hardcore shows. And I've been there for all but maybe five, like when they went to Australia, I didn't do those shows. But wow. uh, House of Hardcore has been something very, very special, very near and dear to my heart. And um, I will always sing House of Hardcore's praises. I will always sing Tommy's praises, not just because of who he is to me, but because he's amazing. He's, he's talented. He lives and breathes professional wrestling like nobody has ever really discovered, like to the point where I'm like, bruh, are we still watching wrestling right now? Because I'm tired. Like, <laughs> <laughs> where you, where you, where you kind of get to that threshold, but it's this is what this is what he was meant to do. This was his lot in life. How are there dogs 
barking and doing a podcast, and I'm in a hotel. Uh, when did okay. that happen? That's okay. You've you've got a uh, my dog is more over on my show or our show than than I am. So yeah, my dog's barking all the time. Only when I'm doing a podcast does everything that could happen happen because this is my fourth podcast down here this week. I've been doing them. Oh my goodness! Back to back to back to back which I enjoy because um, I like doing them when I'm like at the hotel and I would do my work, take care of my work, take care of whatever Tommy needed and then book my times and work around all of that. So I've been down here and every time I, I get on a podcast, whatever could happen down here, but I've (laughs) never heard a dog barking whilst doing a podcast down. That was a first. Well, there you go. We're glad that that happened on our show. Hey, I, you got to love the first. I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. It's so crazy. <laughs> I'm good with that. Uh, the talk is great. I listen to him on Busted Open a lot. And I uh, I mean, on, even on that show, like, I, and I could see what you're talking about, how he kind of lives wrestling. Because, yeah, I mean, there's probably not much time when he's not talking about wrestling. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that's part of the reason why I listen to the show. Always uh, talking. He's always talking. I, I believe it. <laughs> that is, But that's also why, like, I, you know, and I know that this is, you know, you guys have a podcast, too. But like, you know, House of Hardcore podcast, he has his opportunity to tell his stories, to um, talk to, you know, all of these different people that he gets to he gets to talk to and connect with. And like, I love um, I love his dedications, you know, to like his heroes and, and like him, his episode with Howard Finkel, because I would go with him to see Howard in the hospital yeah um he would go loyally a lot of people didn't know that he was like one of the only people frequently visiting him and so every time i was with him we would go together and we would we would talk to howard and like i've met howard uh, like so many times before that but i'm one of those people that are very um patient with uh dealing with elderly people like i I love connecting and talking and taking that time. And I remember the first time after we went and he was like, you're so patient. You know, he was like, I would, I would, I would probably go crazy because it would make me sad. And I was like, well, it makes me sad, but I love, you know, being able to connect with them and to be nice and to treat them like the human beings that they're supposed to be treated like, because as you know, Sometimes you go in like nursing homes and, and places like that and they start treating, you know, these people like they're not people, you know. Yeah. So I love us going and talking to him about wrestling and talking like, you know, just picking up where, where we left off. Like nothing has happened or like we're not here in this this nursing home or whatever the case might be. And so it broke my heart when he passed away because we missed a time to, to be able to go and visit him. And then the next thing I know, he passed away. So that like, that hurt my heart. And I knew, I knew that it hurt him. Um, and so, you know, I like that he has his platform to voice his memories and his feelings. And he's just a wealth of knowledge. Like he forgets everything else and he'll forget his name, but he knows everything about professional wrestling. He never forgets anything as far as professional wrestling goes. So. Um, the man is brilliant. That brain is all for professional wrestling. Yeah, I can see that. I can totally see that. Um, I, I heard him talking about, uh, of course, when he did his tribute to the Road Warriors, uh, right. which was amazing. Um, yeah. I heard that show when he talked about him passing away, and you could just genuinely tell um, how that affected him um, yeah. on the show. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, heartbreaking. Yeah. The last time he was with him was the last time we were all together. We were at a um, a convention, and I was like in between the two of them, and I started talking to him, and we started talking about family. We weren't even talking about wrestling. Um, we start. He started talking about his kids and his grandkids and his wife, and just like family and love. And I'm like, well, I have ten kids, and he's like, you're crazy. But you know, we started. <laughs> 
<laughs> we, we got into all of that and like we were exchanging photos in between like him doing all the autographs and stuff like that and then um he gave me some of his little um his little vinyl figures for my grandsons uh, and he, he gave me two because he was like you have two grandsons so i don't want them fighting over them so i'm, I'm gonna give you two and i was just like that was so sweet and that was the first time that i actually got to talk to him as like a human being and not like talk about wrestling um, or about wrestling work because he's worked plenty of House of Hardcore shows. So I had to be like, um, not a boss because I never saw myself as a boss, but like somebody that's like making sure that he's taken care of, making sure that he has what he needs, making sure that people are attending to his needs, making sure that, you know, er everything's cool. You know, his money's good, everything's good. I didn't, I didn't have to do that. We talked as people that loved our families. And that was the last time that I saw him, which was the last time that Tommy saw him. Uh, and, um, wow. It shocked the hell out of me. I was just like, what? Because, you know, I follow his wife and like they had just celebrated like their anniversary and everything. Yeah. That's oh, why man. I did the... um. I did the dedication to Roy Road Warrior Animal with the whole face thing um, before Tommy actually did the the thing for Impact because I bought the shirt and so I wanted to do the makeup and I had never done that makeup before. So I sent him a picture and I was like, this is harder than I thought it was gonna be. Like an hour and a half in, I'm still trying to draw the spider. I'm like, how did how did they do this? I don't even know. Like I really had like trouble, but I, I did it. And um, I think somebody sent it to his wife because she started like, you know, liking and commenting on all of all of that stuff. And I loved that Tommy did it, and that you know, I mean, he he more than did it; he embodied it. Right. Yes, he did. The hell, he embodied it when he came out. He became, you know, that persona, and I loved that. I and that's what I'm saying. You're not going to find too many people that are that passionate about professional wrestling and why isn't he in the wwe hall of fame yet? yes let's talk about that yes why the hell is this man not in the wwe hall of fame yes i i hey i'm all for it i'm sure jeff is too uh um, yeah that's that's a a great point because i mean you think about it what he's done for the business as a whole is one thing and that should be celebrated and, and yeah. more people should be singing his praises. But what he did as a part of ECW and then going into WWE yeah. when ECW was purchased, I mean, my goodness. I, I mean, he honestly, he is ECW. I, yeah. when, yeah. whenever, I mean, yeah. whenever, whenever anyone mentions ECW, the very first name I think of is Tommy Dreamer. It's not anyone else. It's Tommy Dreamer because, in my opinion, he put it on the map. And then when WWE purchased it, he was still putting on great matches, doing all these great things. But also you could tell that he was giving back to the younger talent as well. Absolutely. And, and still to this day, exactly. giving back to the younger talent. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like Most people would have... I'm not gonna say stopped, but he could have stopped at being like the heart and soul of ECW, but yet he's still so submersed in professional wrestling today. He's still so much a part of things. He's a lot of brains behind uh, a lot of stuff that happens in, in, in Impact. I mean, you know, he, he works in creative. He has so much still to offer that is so fresh and new that you would sit and go, how is he, how does he think of these things? But it's because his brain never turns off where professional wrestling is concerned. So because it never turns off, it's always churning with ideas and things that he wants to implement and put into play. And he can spot talent just like that. And if he can put them on the map, that's what he does. If he can put them over, that's what he does. He is, he is, to me, the heart and soul of what professional wrestling is supposed to be. That's even beyond ECW. And right. but that's just my little two cents. 
No, yeah, I agree. Every time I hear, you know what? Every time I see someone pick up a kendo stick, I think of Tommy. Every <laughs> so single funny. time. That you every say, single time. I'm about to get the kendo stick tattoo because I have um, I have a TD tattoo for you know Tommy Dreamer, and I was like, you know, this would be it would be perfect if I get the kendo stick because I I've always had a love for that kendo stick. Yep. He would call me crazy because I'm like, I need you to hit me with that. He's like, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not hitting you. What is wrong with you? You're crazy. <laughs> like, this is, this, is, this is who I am. This is my life. I'm like, just, just hit me one time. He's like, no, I'm not. I won't hit you with it. I'm like, fine. I'll just get the tattoo then. And my birthday is coming up. So um, I'm going to gift myself. Uh, a Kindle stick tattoo. Um, That's awesome. Uh, where I have the TD because I love and like, you're right. Every time I see a Kindle stick, I don't think about anything else but yep. Tommy. I mean, even though of of course nowadays, like I see because Sandman has it all the time. Every right, time right. Him, and he comes out. He has that Kindle stick. I had just they just did a show in um, Palmdale, New Jersey, a few weeks back that I was there for. And um, of course, he came out with that kendo stick, and I get a rise every time. I don't know what it is, and you see that stick, and you're just like, "Fuck yeah!" Oh yeah, yep. On your you, show or not? No, no you're fine. Anyway, I told <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So. It ha hey, I, I would say the same thing. I mean, I, you know, the entrances to uh, his his entrance was he came out to enter Sandman, uh, the Metallica song. Oh, uh, it was so good. So good. Does. So and that's the cool thing that I love about HOH too is because, you know, Tommy will mix talent, new talent with veterans, with people like all in between. And he was like one of the only people that can get people from all different shows. Like the time that he had somebody going over to WWE uh, on the show, uh, people from AEW doing the show, people from Impact doing the show, people from just the Indies doing the show, all of them were clamoring to do a House of Hardcore show. And then, of course, toward the end, what do you hear? Into Sandman. Now you know you're in for something good because yeah. Sandman gonna take eight minutes to walk around the ring with his beers, <laughs> but you're there for it. You know what I'm saying? Like you're oh. gonna wait this whole length of time until he finally gets in the ring and starts kicking somebody's ass. Oh man, so it good. never gets old to me. It never gets old to me, never. Nope. Nope, but yeah, I absolutely agree. I absolutely I love agree so much. I I love that man so much. He taught me. He taught me a lot that um I didn't learn from from Tommy, and he's not afraid to teach you about about things you know with professional wrestling. And for him, him being a man teaching me how to be a uh, a better woman in what I'm doing in the business. You know, and he's given me invaluable advice that I've been able to utilize and teach my daughter, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, for when she would come out with me, the times that she come out with me. Man, I love that man to pieces. I really do. Hack is my heart. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. So, uh, and, all right, before I get back to Jeff and then I'll push it back over to you, Jeff, I got to ask you one more thing. And we put everybody on the spot with this question. Every time we talk to somebody about horror, I've got to ask you, um, what, what is your favorite horror movie ever? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? And I know, unfair. oh, I know I, I, everybody tells us the same thing. <laughs> so but I got to ask, I get asked this question and my answer is always kind of a cheat because I always say that um, it evolves sometimes or it, it bounces between how I feel. My number one favorite, which is going to be weird for me, has always been The Fog. Oh, okay. The, classic, the Fog. But it was because for me, it was real. It was yes. like, it, even though it was, it was based on more than just that, it was like, Anytime fog hit outside, I got scared and ran inside. Okay. Like, nope, fog about to get me. I'm about to die. It's going to be like some people come out the fog, kill me. I can't do this. Like, that's why it scared me so much. But I have Candyman is just 
a a classic scary yep. movie to me, even though I don't get scared. Like I don't get scared if I like say it in the mirror or whatever, but it's a classic scary movie for me because okay. I mean, it's, it's scary. And then I'm allergic to bees. So it's really scary for me. <laughs> like, one of those motherfuckers could kill me. So <laughs> just, just imagine if there's like a, a hornet's nest of them. Yes. But, um, but like I said, um, it tends to evolve because one of my other scary movies, I have weird, uh, scary horror movies. Christine was also great a film. scary movie for me. And it's a great flick. And like, I think it's undersung. Like a lot of people don't talk about Christine that much, how, you know, this car basically comes to life and that this guy has this relationship with this car. It's kind of really like a classic thing. If you think about it, like men have relationships with their cars, but this was unnatural. Yes. Um, obviously Christine is a great, great movie and it's also one of my um one of my favorite uh scary movies but that's you know when you're thinking in terms of kind of uh older movies so because you only asked me for one and i gave you three i'm just gonna stick with that <laughs> fair enough man fair enough that's awesome uh yeah. yeah i love i loved all of them uh yeah. the fog's great i haven't seen the remake and i, I you know what i don't sometimes like to because i think don't. they ruin things sometimes don't. with stuff don't. yeah no, I did it. I did it just because I had to do it because um, as a horror actress and, you know, like being interviewed and stuff like that, I get asked like, you know, well, what did you think about the remake of this? Or what did you think yeah. about this? Or what did you think about that? So a lot of the times I'll watch them just to be able to, you know, give my piece. But to me, I always feel like why mess with a classic? Yeah, it's true. It just... You know, people just try to redo stuff and redo stuff. Just come up with your own concepts and do something, you know, fresh. Uh, but I digress because people are always going to try to revive something, you know, that was a classic. And to me, it damages that. Yeah. Um, I always well, stick with the classics. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I it's and I think it's I, I, people have a fascination with nostalgia, and I think that they just like going back to things that. But you're right. I mean, you can't do say this, and this is how I was. with I am and always will be a fan of the original Halloween. I still think it's one of the best movies ever, and Absolutely. and the fact that when Rob Zombie did his remake, uh, I I I I could see why people would like it, but from my standpoint, and I think John Carpenter actually did an interview about it, saying that he kind of felt the same way. Like it kind of making you feel bad for that kid when the, the kid was younger and stuff, and you saw that making you feel bad for him kind of took away from like the mystique of the whole thing. Yeah. And that's what I was the same way. So you're right. I, I think you're right. Things just, I think sometimes are better left alone. Yes, um, yes, just, yes, just enjoy yes. them for what they are. And move forward. And yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a whole nostalgia thing for me. It's always kind of been um, like a, a nostalgia thing. And I know it's like really weird and it's kind of going off topic, but like, I've always been a Trekkie, but I'm a old, mm. I'm a classic Star Trek Trekkie. I couldn't get into any other Star Trek because I couldn't mess with, you couldn't mess with, you know, Captain James T. Kirk. Oh, my goodness. This dude is having sex with blue women. <laughs> Green women. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh. Like, I couldn't, you, I grew up watching that in the honeymooners oh my god i love that show i still watch it all the time watch, you know honeymooners is on amazon now yes. um, and so i've been watching as a matter of fact last night like tommy was like what are you watching i was like the honeymooners oh. he was like i've never watched an episode i said oh what? my god that's so good <laughs> i'm gonna run this right now because you about to watch this like oh. <laughs> i grew up my great grandmother because i was raised by my grandmother and my great grandmother i grew up with like a lot of old school stuff like even when they were listening to richard pryor and eddie murphy on vinyl yes. and i would run up to the door and listen because they're listening to the record like they're not watching 
the TV show or something like that. They were, they're listening to it on vinyl and I would like run up to the door and listen to it and I would hear the curse words and I'm like, and you know, again, comedy. I was heavily influenced by what I was surrounded by because I didn't grow up with my brother. Um, you know, he grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. Um, so this is what I grew up with. And then I grew up with Star Trek and then Honeymooners and I Love Lucy and then later like the Carol Burnett show. And so I was heavily influenced by those things that I grew up around and then came wrestling. Like my great grandmother loved Bruno San Martino. That was like one of her favorite uh, wrestlers. And um, I used to watch, she used to watch on black and white. Like she watched black and white wrestling. I still don't even know like I, I couldn't tell you anything. I just remember seeing wrestlers in, I used to go uh, men in underpants in black and white. Wrestling. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm like, why is she watching these men in these big underwear wrestling, like, yeah. like fighting each other? I, you know, I never use the term wrestling, but I'm like, they're just like fighting each other in these big underwear in this ring and it's in black and white and what's going on. And then later on, you know, I started watching WWF at the time yep. and then i was like oh this is what this is mm -hmm. all right so i really had a history and so when i met bruno san martino it was one of those wow moments because it was something from my great grandmother who was born in 1910 you know um and i was just like wow the guy that my great grandmother used to watch and he's standing before me and wow. he's like hugging me and talking to me and i'm listening to him he was the guest speaker that was the first time that i met tommy was the first time that i met bruno san martino wow and um so much history was in that room that's also the first time i met lita as well so it was like history was established for me in <sighs> wrestling where my love of professional wrestling and my the beginning of my working in professional wrestling met in 2011 in Atlanta, Georgia at the, it was kind of like a bagels, bicep, biceps and brunch kind of thing. It was a brunch thing that they had. And Bruno San Martino was the guest speaker there. And my daughter was like, we have to go here because I have to sit next to Christy Hemi and eat brunch. That was why we went. We went so that my daughter can meet Christy Hemi because she was obsessed with her, still is. And but there was all of these other people. She was like, I don't care who else is there. I just want to meet her. And that was it. And that was that started my entire life of how everything has changed in my life because everything is just so different um, right now. And I hate to say it, but like I do have to mention it, even though I'm like mentioning the good with the bad. I've been getting a lot of hate mail recently. Um, because remember we just talked about nostalgia. So you want to talk about nostalgia and um, you know, like Tommy Dreamer and Beulah McGillicuddy. And so now it's like, there's Monique running around and people are just like, who are you? Get out of here, you know, go away. And so I've actually been getting like threats and things like that and oh, which is man. cool. Um, but, uh, but I've been dealing with it. and. Also, that's not like, that's not the real professional wrestling fans. You know what I'm saying? Because like I said, we're, we're a hardcore community, no pun intended. We're, we're a hardcore community. So, you know, as soon as some of them will see stuff like that, they jump in and it's like, you know, she, you know, she's contributed to, you know, wrestling, professional wrestling as well and blah, 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 this, that, or the other. But it's been a rough road lately because people have nothing but time during this COVID that's when everything really started blowing up because I mean, everybody's kind of like at home or you can't really go out and do stuff and you can't really go out to the bars. So I feel like we have more keyboard warriors than normal because we're dealing with COVID. So you got to take the good with the bad. And, you know, I just say that to say, you know, everything is not like daisies and roses or what have you, but you, you have to learn how to move forward. And I've, I kind of learned that from Tommy, like, you know, he said, you know, there can be so much negative on social media, but there's also positives. And you have to learn how to kind of hone in on all of the things that are positive with social media and just continue to press on with that and just kind of leave the negative alone. 
That is very true. That is very true. I know Jeff's been dealing with some of that himself. So uh, great words there. Jeff, it's uh, – go right ahead, my friend. Well, thank you. Yeah, is I mean, some people, like you said, there are a lot of keyboard warriors out there. And, Absolutely. you know, people that will say something behind a – keyboard or a screen but if they were ever to see me in a street they would walk or run the other way because um you know i'm not a, i'm not a small dude and i i know how to use that to my advantage so um, but you know it, it just i think it comes and i'm saying this and you know not saying that that this show is like huge or anything but Anytime you step out in the public eye at all, people feel the need to offer criticisms or um, their commentary on you and your personal life when, you know, they have no they have no reason to do that. And they, have, uh, they also have no clue about your personal life. Exactly. Like for as much as I share and and I think that people don't understand that for as much as I share on social media you get 5% of a glimpse of my life. You get flashes, you know, you don't, you can't assume that you know somebody's life because you Googled something. Right. You, you just can't, you don't know what people's private lives are, but guess what? That's not your job to know anyway. Your job is not to know about what's going on with me and my private life, or, you know, who I'm dating or who I'm this or who, you know, that's not your job to know, you know, just love what it is that the person is offering up in their professional life. And again, I give glimpses. Like I love, I love showcasing my kids because they, they work in the business in various forms of fashion. So they always go, mom, you know, are you going to post me mom? Are you going to, so I proudly promote my kids, but you get, this much of a glimpse of my family life and and my children and you know all of that stuff that that goes on behind it but that's with any like and i never i don't like to use my word and my name and celebrity because i never look at myself and go celebrity but you people that are in the public eye so to speak you never know what it is they're that they're going through i learned that with my brother like people would just assume that they knew exactly what was going on with him. Even though I'm the little sister, I was always the one that was ready to punch somebody in their face. When we're together, he'd be like, sis, sis, calm down. Just, you know, <laughs> chill out, or whatever. You know, just let them have their thoughts or whatever it is that they're going through. But people want so badly to know what's going on on the inside that sometimes they're willing to create these scenarios in their head to put out there, which is just so wrong, so wrong. You know, just let people live their lives. You don't understand sometimes that you're causing people more strife, you know, than, than you are helping them. And if you love your people, like, you know, you love these, these wrestlers, you love these people that's in the spotlight, don't, don't do stuff like that. Just accept what they do in their professional lives and leave their personal lives alone. Just because you see something like somebody before in one of the wrestling group chats, they saw me and Tommy, we would do a lot. We would go to like a lot of sports events, basketball, hockey, baseball. And then we had just started football. So people would see us. The minute they see us, it's like I'm unnamed black woman and Tommy Dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is which is cool but like one time I my daughter found a picture of us that somebody took of us just sitting there watching the game um and was like well what's going on here I thought he was married and it literally was a thread in a wrestling forum and it's like why would you do that just let the man enjoy the fact that he was going to a game you know, and what if that was a coworker? What if I was a, just a coworker? I mean, which I am as well, but I'm just saying, you know, you just automatically race to the to the thought of 
you know, he has to be cheating or he has to be doing this or this has to be happening. And it was like a whole thread that that happened until one of her one of her friends that she works with went on like, you know, can you please stop talking about my friend? You know, her name is Monique Dupree. Mind your business kind of thing and, and shut it down. Um, but that's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah, it really, it really is. And I, I will say this, though, as a as a side note on a brighter point, um, your brother is one of my heroes. Like He's he mine as well. <laughs> he uh, Joe can probably attest. I talk about him probably at least once a week. Uh, <laughs> he does. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, he he is definitely one of my heroes. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna bring up something that Joe wouldn't bring up. Uh oh. Okay. And, uh, and we we kind of talked about this a little bit in uh in our messages back and forth, but obviously, like Joe said, we love Impact Wrestling, and we we love everything that they have going on, nice. and you know, all the storylines and, and all of those things. And one of the storylines that we've really latched on to as a podcast is the whole who shot John E. Bravo. <laughs> um, <and> yes. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that, even to the point where uh, we got a little creative and did some law and order type videos <laughs> with uh, clips of Joe saying things about the, uh, one of the ladies that he loves in impact and that's Rosemary. Uh huh. So, uh, we keep, we keep joking because we were, we were, uh, on the podcast one night and Joe said, Oh, well, I, I got this call on it. And it's a, a unknown uh, name here. And, uh, we were just joking around saying that it was, that it was Tommy dreamer. So, um, <laughs> How much? How much did he have to do with that storyline? If you, um, if you know any of that behind the scenes stuff, and um, I, I mean, it's just so fun. Like I was saying in in the message back and forth with you. Well, I mean, I I guess well, I don't I don't want to give away anything. <laughs> right, right. right. Um, but um, again, he has a he he has a great brain for for wrestling and for uh creating um new and exciting things and storylines and such and i also he likes to keep me as a fan with it mm -hmm. so i i was far removed from a lot of the stuff dealing with that because even i was like who shot him <laughs> 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 And then, like, I keep I keep throwing my my theories out, and I, I'm always I'm a bad guesser at at almost anything. But I was like, I think Taya did it. <laughs> I don't even know why. I just I just feel like for some reason I keep looking at her smile, and I'm like, that's a smile of somebody that would do something like that. Yeah, she did it. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, but no, he, I mean, I will say that he loves this whole storyline he loves being able to 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 do this this has been like amazing and that's what i mean too like impact has been finding new and different ways of keeping things fresh um keeping things fun and keeping the wrestling element at the same time and i think that that's so cool like you know who else would like just normally when you have a wedding or something like that there's always a problem like it never goes off. This one goes off without a hitch, right? And right. then all of a sudden, boom. Exactly. You exactly. know, it and that's it's brilliant. If you think about it, it's it's pretty freaking brilliant because yeah. they could have gone away of, well, let's have this wedding and then something happens in the wedding and blah 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 blah. Nope. We 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 made it through the whole thing. Yep. And boom. Um I love that. I mean, it's a it's an amalgam of like you know, of course, all creative. Uh, I have to say that I feel like um, you know Scott Demore and Don Callis and Tommy Dreamer 
uh, together and and D'Lo, like they come up with some really great stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, and I told you, I watched TNA when it was TNA. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and of course it was before them, but like it started to dwindle to me. And they just brought life back into Impact Wrestling in a way that I never thought I would see it happen. I never thought that I would watch it over like watching Raw or SmackDown. I barely watch it anymore. I love like one of my favorite um one of my favorite pay-per-views is the Royal Rumble. So I never miss a Royal Rumble. Um WrestleMania for the last few years, I've always done a watch party with uh with Dreamer. I used to go to WrestleMania with my daughter, but like she started going with her girlfriends and I would just do a watch party because as working on the other end of things, instead of being out there, uh, you know, in the audience, you know, I usually do the whole appearance thing with him and we'll watch with fans somewhere else, you know, at a different location. But like impact has just become my favorite thing to watch. And it's because things like those segments that are the reasons that they keep me watching all the time yeah and so that's 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 pretty much all i'm gonna say okay. <laughs> about that and, mm-hmm. and i think it's taya so if 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 you find out it's taya you could say i said it <laughs> well i mean taya taya did rip out someone's spine on talking shop too so uh <laughs> she's got I, a little bit of a you know <laughs> i just really feel like she has that smile that's that just goes i do dirt like <laughs> <laughs> it's just yes. really it's 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 too bright and too you know unassuming that you yeah. have to assume that she up to no good yeah <laughs> that's awesome absolutely yeah so, we, so that's you, my that's my blind guess to this whole thing and i'm not i'm not gonna deviate at all because you know sometimes you'll you'll hear new clues or whatever and then you start deviating and then they jump back because it's some kind of twist or whatever nope i'm sticking with Taya the whole through the whole thing well you you can tell you can tell mr dreamer that you know if he needs to expand his suspect pool um he should take a listen to a couple of our watch alongs on tuesdays because now, wait a minute what, what are you doing to me here <laughs> I, I, I will do. I kept looking. I kept looking because I was wondering if they were going to be coming through the door at some point in time. Because it's well, no, it's still a little bit early yet right now. Um, but this is usually a little bit later than this is around the time that they come through the through the door. And okay. I was I was hoping that he would have come through the door while I was on because he would have come over here like, "What are you doing?" Um, <laughs> but um, in, in classic Tommy Dream fashion, <laughs> but he, I think that they're still, um, they're still working. So yeah, I will definitely let him know though. Yeah, I told uh, sorry, him I had no. podcast today, so you know he was like, just let me know, you know how it went and whatnot. So okay, sorry, Joe, I, I had to throw my co-host under the bus. But... Dude, you're killing me here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, oh my God. I do. I do want to ask you though. I, this is the last question that I have for you. But um, I mean, just just in following you and seeing all the things that you do, um, you're. I mean, you're so much of an inspiration to me, and I know many others. Um, what advice would you give uh, a person. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's wrestling, acting, singing, modeling. What advice would you give someone about chasing after their dreams and not only chasing after it, but devoting the time it takes to make those things, those dreams become a reality? Well, first of all, the thing that I always tell people, and I, I mostly speak to young people, women who will come to me about all different kinds of things is that in this business, you have to have a thick skin, which I I had to learn about, like, you really, you have to develop a thick skin just to, just to start to break your way into any part of the entertainment industry, 
period. Um, doesn't matter what, what part it is. But I've always found that for me, because I know some people say nice guys finish last. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's not necessarily true. Um, be nice, be kind, be vigilant in what it is that you want. Um, people will sometimes give you negativity uh, to deter you. And it's up to you to decide whether or not you're gonna accept that negativity or whether you're gonna move past it and move forward. Um, I always say think outside the box because I had to think outside the box in order to, to move forward in this business, in, in any part of this business. Um, I've never been a person that's been a by the book person. And that is why I've been able to accomplish so much because I always think outside the box. Um, it's especially hard for women in, in any part of this business uh, because you get the the sex stuff. Um, I have a couple of very famous actors that had told me that they would put me in movies if I gave them head. And I said, well, I guess I'm not going to be in that movie. Wow. Um, because I wasn't willing to um, degrade myself for a movie role. And so I would definitely say to men and women alike, because it happens with men to stay true to yourself, stay on your own path. You don't have to deviate from your path to try to get somewhere faster. We want everything is fast food today. We want fast food success. You know, we want fast food results. To get where you want to get will take time. You have to be willing to have that patience and to take that time and to be diligent and passionate enough to continue to move forward even when you're knocked down. I got knocked down a hundred times. It was that hundred and first time that that opportunity came about. But what if I had stopped after the second time or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time? I would have never seen myself where I was because I kept getting knocked down and I kept getting back up. You have to learn the art of being able to do that without uh, making it personal. It's hard. It's, it's a hard negotiation because when you hear no or you're to this or you're to that or whatever, people take it personally. I've had to learn how to just let that roll off my shoulders and move forward. I've been told I had to get smaller boobs. I've been told I had to change my nose. And this is for like all, all facets of the entertainment industry that, that I've been in. I've been told that I had to get head. I've been told that I had to have sex. I've been told because I was black, I wasn't gonna get anywhere. Like I've been told so many different things. And um, no, it's not like I'm like super famous, and that's mostly because I don't wanna be there. I don't wanna be where my brother is if I could help it because he can't go outside without people really bothering him. Mm. And what I don't say that, like he doesn't complain, understand. But when I'm with him, I'm like, well, damn, they won't even let you eat, bro. And he's like, I know, I know. He was like, I just, I just want to have a moment. But he was like, it's okay. You know, these are my fans. And I'm like, no, it's not okay. I'm finna just tell everybody, leave you the hell alone. I said, let me be the bad guy. You go ahead and be the good guy. We play good cop, bad cop sometimes. Well, well he doesn't want me to. I just do it anyway because I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's the whole point of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, <laughs> be your own person. Don't let what people tell you deter you from what you want and where you want to go. Remember when I had just done three films and I was pregnant with my second child, I was told I would never do any more films. I would never get ahead, uh, much less do what I've done and accomplish what I've accomplished. I was told that I would never go anywhere in wrestling, not anywhere because of my age at the time. And I said, okay. And even though I accepted that partially, Tommy came along and was like, what do you mean? You're good. I want you to do this. And it, 
it reestablished that for me. So I would just say, just be vigilant in what it is that you want to, what you want to do. Have your goals and don't let other people's advice stop you from where you want to go. You keep going until you can't go anymore. And then even then push a little bit harder because there's a lot of people that want to do what we do, but there's only a handful of people that do what we do. It's not because they're, they're more talented in some cases or, or more special. It's just that they've been more passionate, more diligent. They've pushed harder. You know, they were willing to push past things that other people couldn't push past. That's, that's my biggest advice. Um, is all of that, <laughs> all of it. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. If that makes any sense, you know, because I'm a living example of it. Just like, you know, when people said you'll never be in good shape, you know, you've had 10 kids and then I dropped 80 pounds. And I'm in the best shape, the best physical shape of my life. Like Dreamer was like, you're jacked right now. Like, you know, I live in the gym. Every time he, like I, I work out in the gym in the morning and when he comes back, where are you going? I'm just gonna go to the gym for a minute. He's like, listen, don't you think you should just chill for a minute? Like, you know, because it's, it's become a habit, but like I lost 80 pounds. I got in shape at 45 when people told me that I would never be in any monochrome of shape because I kept having children. I didn't listen to what they said. If I had listened, I would just go, yeah, you're right. And I would never try. And I had no money. I had to put together my own fitness plan. I had to put together my own meal plan. There wasn't uh, these meal prep things that everybody has. It was just Monique Dupree doing Monique in the kitchen. That's it. That's all. I had no gym. I couldn't afford a membership. I used the staircase. I used weights. I used um, paint cans. I used my own body weight, calisthenics. I stretched. I thought outside the box. And it's easy for anybody to do if you're just willing to do it. You can do anything you want and you don't need money to do it. And I'm a prime example because I'm broke as hell because I got 10 kids. <laughs> people don't understand the money that I make don't go to me it automatically go to them so they go well I figured you making money whatever money I'm making I don't see it it's like Al Bundy it's gone <laughs> I sit here I get paid the one day and two hours later I'm broke because my daughter is in gymnastics she's seven years old she's been in gymnastics since she was 12 months old you know, I have a model, I have somebody working in wrestling, I have this person, I have that person, they're all doing stuff. I'm paying for it. I'm broke. <laughs> so I have to do everything the thrifty way. So you can do anything you put your mind to. Once your mind can get past things, your body will follow suit. Just do it. That's that's, awesome. that's my advice. Amazing advice. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight. And thank you. I really truly appreciate you listening to me ramble and talk about crazy stuff. And um, I really truly appreciate it. This has um, probably been one of my best uh, podcast interviews because I was able to like really just genuinely um, talk about what I wanted to talk about. That's awesome. And we got a first. We got a dog barking, too. So there you go. Yes, yes. <laughs> I did not believe that I was in a hotel and a dog started barking. I was like, okay. So we had kids in a bar, which wasn't a thing before, in a bar. And then then we had dogs barking in a bar. And I said, yeah, I'm done. We got kids and dogs all in the bar today because I decided to come downstairs and and do a podcast because when i'm upstairs in the room you know i feel stagnant so i have to move around like i did a photo shoot today you know i i dealt with some other stuff that tommy needed me to do i worked out and i was just like i'm gonna come downstairs 
uh, with my own glass of wine, by the way, because I had my own bottle upstairs. So I poured a glass and brought it down. I ain't there even, you, go. you know, there you go. I come with my own. I told you, I create my own everything um, <laughs> because you have to, you really have to, you have to think outside the box in every sense of the word. I do my own fashion. I do my own hair. I learned how to do all of that stuff myself because I couldn't afford to pay somebody to do it. So I sat there and took out the time to learn everything, to learn about fashion, to learn about textures, to learn about men's fashion. And I'm so glad that I did that because, you know, Tommy would be like, I, I outfitted him for two Hall of Fames that he was at where they showed him. I picked out his his clothing, essentially. The one year he had on a, a black suit, a black suit with a black shirt and a burgundy tie. Um, I was it was in New Orleans. I ran around trying to find a shirt and a tie for him to go with his suit. And I was like, black on black would look awesome and the burgundy would give that pop with him. And then when they showed him on camera, I said, Yeah, I did that. I just felt so good, but I felt good because like this is this is part of my passion. This is part of something that I love to do that I'm able to see out there. And even though it's not like it was written like, you know, outfitted by Monique or something like that, I knew that I did that. So I know that I can do that. I can affect do that kind of thing if I wanted to start doing it more because it's just an instinctual thing that I look at somebody and go, okay, this would be cool for you. And then I have to have a budget because, you know, we work on a almost no budget shoestring budget type of deal and learn how to do stuff like that and make you look like a million dollars when it's just $30, <laughs> you know, think it outside the box. There you, there you go. go. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, hopefully we can do this again. Absolutely. Whoops, jinx. <laughs> All right. I, 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 yeah, you can come on anytime. <laughs> hey, whenever you guys are, are, are ready to have me, you let me know. I'm doing uh, like five more films in the next two months' time, Horror, all horror films, and I'm hoping that we, you know, we have some more wrestling stuff. I mean, I don't think we're doing anything else for the rest of this year, unfortunately, in terms of wrestling. But you know, I'm still doing the podcast, and we're still doing Twitch and stuff like that. But if you wanted to have me on to talk about the horror films, I'll have like four or five more projects that I've worked on since. Perfect. So, perfect. Awesome. Thank cool. you guys. I appreciate. Thank you so much. And you have a good night. All Thank right. you very much. Take care and say hello to Tommy for us. I absolutely will. As soon as he comes in, I'll, I'll let him know. Very cool. Well, it was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, really, really love talking to you, and uh, you're such an inspiration. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Good night, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.